That tells me that that school does not have a curriculum. Because if they had a curriculum, they would have, you know, we have done this before. We have been doing this for hundreds of years. So why are we reinventing the wheel every single week? It's really just preposterous. Welcome to Classical Etc., a show that dives into the philosophy, culture, and heart of classical education. You're in the studio with Shane Saxon. On today's episode of Classical Etc., I got a chance to discuss Martin Cothran's article, What is a Curriculum? This is the first in a brand new chapter of Classical Etc., where we discuss various articles published in the magazines of Memoria Press, Simply Classical, The Classical Teacher, and The Classical School. On today's episode, we discussed what is a curriculum, where Martin argues that a curriculum needs to be clear, coherent, consistent, complete, calibrated. We also discussed all of Martin's thoughts about curriculum that didn't make it into the article and got left on the cutting room floor. If you like this conversation, then please like this video or drop a comment below. Without further ado, let's jump right in. So thanks for joining me, Martin. We're going to try something different here that hopefully we'll get to continue doing. For those who aren't familiar, Memoria Press releases a number of magazines. So four times a year, we release The Classical Teacher. We also release a magazine called The Classical School, as well as Simply Classical. And in them, we display our curriculum, but also have a a series of really good articles. And you often, you're a machine. You're writing a number of these articles Mm -hmm. each quarter that we're putting out The Classical Teacher. Um, And so this podcast and hopefully future podcasts will be discussions. You've worked really hard to make this a bullet. It's it's saying one thing and it's saying it really well, but you have a lot more to say even a, about the topic that we have here. So this article is called What is a Curriculum? And it is in the winter 21, 2021 edition of the Classical School. Um, so Martin, let me just read you the first paragraph. And then I had a question right off. At I, the I hope I recognize it. Um, after many years of teaching, writing, and speaking about education, and discussing it with more professional educators than I could ever pretend to remember. I've come to an important conclusion. Most schools do not have a curriculum. My question is this, do you try to pretend like you remember them when you're reading these educators (laughs) or do you just, I was not prepared for that. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) um, Well, I mean, uh, you know, you you can never, you, you get these impressions in your mind that develop over hundreds in my case, probably hundreds of conversations and you can't, you couldn't identify a single person who (laughs) who you really, uh, really made you think about this, but, but there are many, (laughs) maybe I should have just said that. And I mean, and that, that, that's actually my real question is, honestly, it's astounding. When I read that sentence, most schools don't have a curriculum. Like you're serious about that. Yeah. And, and I, I think it's effective uh, in persuasion and argument to articulate something in the baldest way possible. Sure. Because it it's provocative. I mean, you, you're provoking people to think. And it sounds preposterous. It sounds outrageous. It sounds um, like a, a, a big overstatement. But what I'm saying is it's not an overstatement at all. Hmm. It's actually, that's actually true. Yeah. That, that what a curriculum is, which I go on in that article and talk about, is not what the vast majority of schools have. Hmm. So what do people think of as curriculum? You talk about it a little bit in the article, but what have you heard people say, this is our curriculum? And you They think of curriculum, despite the fact that uh, in the Latin, it's a Latin word, it's singular. They think of it as plural. Hmm. Uh the, the curriculum, that's a collection of a bunch of stuff that you could use in your school. Yeah. When that's not the original <laughs> meaning of curriculum. Curriculum is the whole thing as a whole, not just a collection of parts. And what a lot of schools have is a collection of parts, but it's not a whole. There's nothing holding it together. There's nothing that makes it one singular overarching thing. Is there anything an admin would say, we have this piece of the curriculum that is an indicator to you that that's not really curriculum there there's other what subjects what are the what's the vernacular that's common when people are talking about curriculum when it's not really curriculum resources mm-hmm. uh th- these are our resources you know everything that was a resource even humans are resources now you, know, you have your human resource department um and i think uh i think that you, you say that balding one of the, the reasons you have to say that um, in that way, I think is because you have to shock some educators into realizing 
what the problem is. Hmm. They think they've got, they all think they've got a curriculum. They all think that they have a whole because they've got a bunch of parts. Yeah. And that's just not true. They don't understand that there is, there, there are things that have to tie it together. There has to be one central purpose for the, for the entire thing that it all has to work together. Um, and, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, in a way I am trying to shock a little bit, Yeah. but, but, uh, you have to do that to make people realize because they did, that's all they know. They just know resources. They, they just know the parts and they haven't thought about the whole thing. Like a good Augustinian, you, uh, you say that people don't have a curriculum because they don't even, they don't, they don't have a love for, for education. And you say the curriculum never gets any love. What do you think causes people to not love the idea of curriculum? What do you, what are the factors there? Well, I, I mean, for one thing, I think it just generally reflects our whole way of thinking about mm -hmm. everything, not just education, but everything. We, we think in fragmented pieces. We, you know, if, if education is passing on your culture, a culture is another one of those things which we use in the plural <laughs> yeah. and we see the pieces, but we don't, we don't think of it as one one thing with some central principle and and all that and so I, I think that's partly what the problem is here is number one we don't realize that what education is for is for passing on a culture and we have a very anemic view of what a culture is so of course that's reflected in the curriculum hmm. so there's there's nothing there for them to love Right. If you would, could, if you could make them see it, and that, that's why you know what we're doing with classical education. You know, we're we're trying to create some. We're we're trying to to um, to pass on something great, something that is beautiful. Uh, Western civilization is a beautiful thing, and if we can see that, and we can see it reflected in the curriculum. Then we'll love the curriculum. Yeah. So a question that rose to the surface for me in the second section is why are people afraid of content? For this curriculum to be coherent, it has to have content. But it seems like that at least is one significant impediment. Is that people are afraid of content for some reason. Do you think that's true? And why do you think that comes Oh, out? absolutely. This is this is one of the worst aspects of the way we train teachers. Um you really see this in teachers' colleges and the progressivist philosophy that is behind the way we we try to train our teachers to be good teachers is it's all process. It's all psychology. Psychology has really taken over education. It's usually not very good psychology. You know, they try to put all these psychological principles into teacher training they give you, you know, weekends worth of training and how basically psychoanalyze children in some ways in the way we 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 were supposed to be doing our instruction. And so actual content has been moved out. And this is why, uh, even though I don't agree with him on every single point, I think that, uh, you know, E.D. Hirsch Jr. has been the great champion of bringing content back to education. And I've talked about him quite a lot in, in many of the articles in the magazine. Uh, and he, he basically makes that case. He says that we all have to have the same background content. Hmm. There has to be some body of knowledge that we all share in order to operate well as a, as a, as a culture, as a society, uh, as an economy, uh, as a, as a political, you know, as a commonwealth. And so, uh, and so, um, so he, he makes that argument that it has to be shared. Now he, he will, when pressed, he says, this is where I differ a little bit. He says that, uh, it doesn't matter what it is as long as it's shared. Hmm. So he's halfway there, but, yeah. but that's an important step. If you can just get people to believe that. And most of what he, what Hirsch advocates is, uh, traditional content. Yeah. So I think that. Uh, kind of a fear of content like you're expressing is a part of the reason why a lot of curriculums aren't coherent. What are other reasons you would identify that prevents curriculums from being coherent in schools? Well, I think that, uh, another one of the, another one of the problems with coherence is just that one thing follows from another there, that there is a progression 
that you have to, I mean, th- th- there is a structure to truth. Mm. And there's a, there's a structure in, in, in every discipline that needs to be observed. And if you don't observe it, there's confusion. So, and, you know, we see this more than anything else in uh, basic skills subjects, in teaching kids how to read, uh, where we've had the problem of, of sight reading, uh, whole word strategies in reading that confound many children because they're not seeing the logic behind the phonetic system that we have. We also see it in, in, in math and arithmetic instruction is we don't realize that there's certain things that we need to teach first. We, we're, we're caught in this, this trap because educators do not understand the difference between the order of knowledge and the order of learning. Mm-hmm. So they think the most important thing should be gotten to as quickly as possible. The concepts need to be uh, uh, stuffed down into the curriculum as early as we can get them when they haven't mastered certain procedural things. They're, they're not observing that in the order of learning, uh, you teach the least important things first. Hmm. Yeah. And they don't get that. And so it, it causes real problems with the coherence of your curriculum when you're teaching things in the wrong order. Yeah. So let me read a portion of your article that I think is a little difficult and I want to hear you unpack it. <laughs> so um, you're talking about how sometimes certain disciplines will get studied themselves in grade school. Um, And you say this, a meta-analysis of the disciplines is fine for ivory tower researchers. But for teachers, the curriculum is not an object of study, but an instrument of the academic operation of a school. Could you unpack that a little bit? Yeah. Um, What what has happened, if you go and you look at, for example, uh, the, the academic standards that states produce, Every state has these, you can usually go and there's a list of standards somewhere. And um, what they do is, what, the, what, what they have done in, in this process is to take a discipline, you know, geography, algebra, whatever it is. They don't even really like to use those words, ironically. Yeah. They, they go through all the disciplines and they look to see what skills are involved. It's usually, it's not knowledge, you know, because we don't like content all that much. It's the skills. And they look to see what skills are uh, these disciplines are made up of. And mm. they take them apart. So there's all these pieces laying on the ground. Yeah. And what they do in these academic doc, academic expectations or standards documents is to just list these skills mm. as if taking apart these disciplines, which are one of the great cultural achievements. I mean, we, we, it's been two for 2000 years, we've been constructing what it is, what learning is mm. and, and package it in a way that is is usable with students. This is a great cultural achievement. Yeah. And what they've done is they've gone and just taken them all apart. <laughs> you know, and I've always said, you know, if I if I take my car uh it, in to get it fixed and and two days later the mechanic calls me back and tells me my car has been fixed and I walk in and the pieces are all over the floor. Yeah. He hasn't done me any good, right? Th- the whole point of having them in a hole and pieced together in a certain way is so that people can use them in yeah. the classroom. It doesn't help to to take all the disciplines apart and put them in a in a in a binder this thick mm. and send them to the teacher. Uh, I know one teacher. He said it was in what's accounted to be the best public school in in the district we're we're in here, and and he said they they would give me binders and binders of all this stuff, and that's mostly what it is. And he said I just put them on my desk, and at the end of the year I throw them in the trash can. <laughs> It, it that that doesn't help you. I mean, yeah. it's a great little thing to think about how things are made up and what skills each discipline is teaching and all that. I mean, that's a an academic subject, but it doesn't help you teach anything. Sure, that's good. It's a great analogy. I, I've taken a lot of things apart that I can't put back together. <laughs> yes, right. Um, so the first point you make is that the curriculum is coherent. The second is that it needs to be clear. Um, and so you talked a lot about the administrator and their role in the clarity of the curriculum. And so, would you have any advice to administrators for making sure that they have a clear curriculum? Yeah. Um, well, I think it is the, it's the administrator's responsibility, number one. And, and this is a problem because again, we train administrators in administrative things, but we don't train them in what education mm-hmm. is and what mm-hmm. learning is. And, and this really needs to be the role of the, of the headmaster at a school 
is to be able to to understand what that hole is that the that the that the curriculum is and and in and in, in articulating this to teachers and in showing them how everything fits because every teacher in their grade and in their subject is in their own little world and they need to understand where they are in the larger picture and and again that's hard for a lot of administrators to do, given the training they've received, if they've been trained, if they have a master's degree in admin- school administration or something, it's just not something they teach. But they need to understand what the curriculum is and how each part fits in with the other and be able to articulate it to their teachers. It seems like even with the pro- the many good services public education provides our society, one drawback is that a lot of times public school administrators are politicians and not educators. Or, or bureaucrats. Or bureaucrats, yeah. yeah. Um, so an additional point from that column is that you, you've talked about how every school should be able to, in a very plain, clear way, describe what their curriculum is. Um, and a lot of schools can't do that. Do you think that there's a tension at all in the modern mindset that for a business or a institution to continue to thrive, it needs to always be growing and reinventing itself and developing versus kind of the alternative that you're suggesting that curriculum should be clear and should be the same and should be consistent. Do you see that tension at all? Oh, absolutely. Because, you know, we're, we're all about innovation. We all have to be changing uh, all the time. I mean, I, 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 I'm actually writing an article about this. I was just thinking about this today. You know, I have these, uh, you know, I, I like trees and so I plant trees in my yard. Yeah. I've been up at five acres, plant a lot of trees. And every once in a while, I'll plant one in a place. And then the year after, I'll look at it and I'll, I'll think to myself, that's in the wrong place. Hmm. So I'll dig it up and I'll put it in another place in the yard. My, my, my wife keeps saying, you're going to kill that tree. And sure enough, it almost always dies. But this is what we do as a culture. Hmm. We dig ourselves up by the roots every generation and try to replant ourselves. Hmm. And as a result, we don't grow. We, we don't, our, our roots don't get down into the, into the earth. And so this whole innovation, this is, that's what I... That's kind of an image of innovation, yeah. the way we, we try to, to do it. And we need to understand that if we're changing our curriculum every year, we're never going to get ahead because the whole point of a curriculum is to get you through this body of knowledge and body of skills so that you're ready for the next level, so that you can go on and start where you left off the previous year. But if you're always changing what's in the grades, then you're never going to get traction. Nope. And you're never going to make progress. Yeah. And and I think people don't understand that. Yeah. One way to preserve it would be to have, articulate very clearly what your curriculum is. And you you charge people to do that. Do you have any advice about for administrators who are taking up that charge? Like, we need to articulate our curriculum. How's the best way to write it? How's the best way to put it out there so that your community knows what this school is providing its students? Well, I think you need to ask yourself the question as a, as a, as an administrator, as a school, if somebody walked into your school and asks you, what are, this, what, are, what are the children going to be learning in sixth grade this year? If you can't answer that question, then there's either something wrong with your knowledge of what you're doing at your school, or there's something wrong with the way you're doing it in your school. Uh, there's some schools that, that, that teachers in the same grades are teaching something different in their classroom than the other sixth grade teachers do. Mm. <laughs> then there's then it that 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 uh, makes it hard for you to answer that question. Yeah, you have to have a coherent answer to the question: What is my child learning in grade X? Yeah. So on that point, that leads into your next argument: is that a curriculum has to be calibrated. Um, and by calibrated, do you mean appropriate for the grade or flesh out what you mean by the, the term calibrated specifically? Well, I mean, you, you have to know. So in, 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 in the second grade, you have to, second grade has to be constructed. So in the light of what you're going to be wanting them to do next year and the year after, and the year after that, it has to be uh, age appropriate for what's being taught in that grade. And it has to contribute and you have to know how it's contributing to what they're learning in the next grade mm. and where it's going eventually. You have to know all those things. And, 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 and I'll say this too. Uh, we're not saying, I'm not saying, that, that every, um, every school administrator 
anyone running a school has to be a curriculum expert. I'm saying, because in, in part I'm making an argument, you know, also for our curriculum, because mm -hmm. it's hard to construct a curriculum. You, know, you have to have a lot of heads involved, which is why I don't think it's a good idea for schools to develop their own curriculum because yeah. they probably don't know enough to do that. You need to have somebody that you can go to um, who has a curriculum that they have put together. And that his, and, and so part of this is just really how do you assess a curriculum? Mm -hmm. You know, someone comes to you with something and, you know, you, these, if you're a public school in particular, you have these little fairs and you have all the vendors come and, and you don't, in the school board or who or the, the whoever the headmaster, whoever it is, is making that decision. They're, they're looking at all these things from the different education publishers and they're, how do they judge? Yeah. How do you know? You haven't, you don't even have time to look through these books. So you end up, you end up buying the most impressive looking, the thing that looks most impressive on, on the display. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm articulating these things to educators, but, but partly, partly because I want them to understand that, that, that they may need to go to somebody who does know curriculum better than they do. And they need to, they're going to buy a curriculum from somebody. They need to ask questions about how coherent this is and how this, how this, uh, you know, is, is this calibrated right? Is yeah. it coherent? You're asking all these questions that I'm asking in this article. So going deeper into exploring that question, you, you wrote specifically the curriculum and its continuous implementation needs to be monitored by the head of school. What are some specific tasks that the administrator does to monitor the curriculum once it's implemented in, in the school? Uh, yeah. And this is a huge problem. Administrators need to be in their classrooms. Mm -hmm. They need to be regularly visiting the classrooms. They need to know what the curriculum, generally speaking, is. And they need to be visiting the classrooms to see that it's being executed there. And, you know, administrators have a lot to do. That, that, that's, that's something they may not have time to do. But they need to find time to do it. Because, uh, you know, you can have, and you can have teachers teaching the same grade, teaching the same material, and everything, and they may be doing it in in such different ways. And you know, as long as they're getting through the curriculum, that's great, so that the next teacher next year can pick up where they left off. But uh, you know, there's, there's a there's a great variability of teaching talent and that sort of thing. And and so there's a there's a there's a whole lot they're going to miss if they're not visiting their classrooms. I mean, I've I've been in schools and I've I've said, okay, you got you got teacher A and teacher B in this grade. One is really good. And the other's not. Now, you don't want to tell the one that's not that they're not a good teacher. But here's something you could do. You could have, just ask both of them to watch the video of the other teacher's class mm -hmm. and tell them, give them positive and negative feedback on what they, if there's something they can improve, tell them what it is and how they can improve it. If something they're doing great, tell them that so that the teacher who's not good can see the teacher who's doing well yeah. and a very classical principle imitate in some way what they're doing. Yeah. That's a great idea. Yeah. What have you, do you have advice for with a teacher who's extremely talented, who because of that maybe doesn't always stick to the curriculum? Well, this, uh, okay, this is a, this is also a big problem. Uh, sometimes the best teachers are not the best teachers <laughs> uh, because they know they're good teachers and they're enthusiastic. I mean, you want a teacher to be enthusiastic yeah. about his or her subject. You, you, you want them to be excited at what they're doing. You want them to be good at it. But at the same time, when you have teachers, and this is this is more true at the lower end of the curriculum than in middle school and high school, but if they think too well of themselves, and maybe rightly, uh, they will be tempted to replace things in the curriculum that they're not seeing. And, and again, they're just one teacher in one grade. They're not looking at the big picture. They're not they're not in a good position to be changing things in the curriculum. And you don't want to slavishly follow any, any curriculum, but the teacher should understand that this is what this child needs to know for the next year. So you've got to cover it. Now do it in the best, uh, even innovative way that you think it should be done as long as you're, you know, following good pedagogy. Um, but 
That's a, it, that's definitely, and it, yeah. you see it in things like Latin. You'll go, I'll go into a Latin class and some teacher who's the pro- professor from the local university, and she knows Latin. She can speak Latin. So she's going to teach those kids to speak Latin, and they don't know their basic grammar. <laughs> you know, it's a constant yeah. problem. So, so w- which is one of the reasons why it's also a good idea to try to develop teachers at your school in the curriculum you're using. If that's really the best best thing because because that kind of thing that, that that you're talking about that's sort of implicit in your question you're talking about somebody who has a natural talent right okay it'd be nice to develop the natural talent in the context of your curriculum mm. rather than to bring somebody in from the outside who's taught another way and they're supposed to teach your curriculum and they think that the way they've always done it is better yeah so the final point you make in the article it feels personal to me is though this comes from your first link series. <laughs> and that is you said you've heard many friends and family say that they, they dread lesson planning. And that is a dread that's oh. never burdened you. <laughs> you hit my pet peeve. <laughs> okay. Uh, so for example, the Memorial press curriculum has lesson plans right. in it. Now, sometimes what they mean is simply preparing for class. Sure. All right. But a lot of schools will require the teacher from scratch to write a lesson plan. That tells me that that school does not have a curriculum Mm. because if they had a curriculum, they would have, you know, we have done this before. We have been doing this for hundreds of years. So why are we reinventing the wheel every single week? It's really just preposterous and they don't see it because that's their world. That's what they've always been asked to do. And lesson planning has been, you get you classes and lesson planning. I was like, where is your curriculum? You have a, you have a department. A lot of schools have a curriculum department. Well, what precisely are they doing there if they're not, if not writing lesson plans for the teachers, if they're if, if, uh, they're um, sharing lesson plans from previous teachers who've mm. already done the work? Why are we why are we doing this all over again every week? It just makes no sense to me, and it is a sign, like I said, that they don't have a curriculum if they're always doing lesson planning, if they're writing their own lesson plans anew every week. Yeah, well. Great work on this article again. Uh, every one of your articles is awesome, and I always enjoy them. You finish, you finish by saying a curriculum must be coherent, it must be clear, it must be calibrated, it must be consistent, and it must be complete. Any so-called curriculum that is not these things is a curriculum in name only. Thanks for writing this. All right. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for joining me for this episode of Classical Etc. If you want to show support for the video, then you can hit the thumbs up icon below to give it a like. Or if you want to leave a comment, you can tell me what conversations you'd like me to have in the future. Check out our Memoria Press YouTube channel to find tons of other educational resources. And also, a huge thank you to the Memoria Press Podcast Network. This is Classical Etc., and I'll see you next time.